Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Ruben E. Goff. Good to be with you here on this great, great Sunday morning. And I got a, a lot of things to get to you real quick because we don't have a lot of time. But here this morning, the very first thing that we want to do is I'm going to finish out part two of Leaving a Church Legacy. It's only going to take the best part of a half hour. And we're going to shoot it first or let you see it first. And then after that, I'm going to come back at the bottom of the hour here and I'm going to come back and introduce a very, very good friend of mine, and he's going to be preaching and teaching the last half of the hour program today here for Experience Life Today. And don't forget, please continue to pray about your giving and those that you're thinking about it, you're meditating about it, you're praying about it. Uh, we really thank all of you that do and are giving, and we ask those that think about it, please continue to pray about it and see what God will do for you. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you at the bottom of the hour. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> Paul writing here, wonderful epistle, it is the, the university level of Christianity in these six chapters. This is the graduation address of Paul to the churches as 2 Timothy is his eulogy to everybody and to his protégés. <clears throat> And as we have been talking, and I want to finish this tonight, as we've been talking, we must become generationally minded. And no longer, as we start on this journey Wednesday night, picked it up again this morning, and now tonight, let us finish it. And realizing as God has opened up this to us, and this understanding of this revelation, that when the baton is passed, if the Lord tarries and the rapture doesn't happen in our lifetime, then we are going to have to hand the baton off to the next generation. And it is all important that we don't drop the baton on the highway, and it is also important that we do not die with the baton clenched in our hands. Amen. As I said this morning with Gehazi, should have had the anointing mantle of Elisha that originally began with Elijah down to Elisha, should have went to Gehazi, should not have been upon his bones. And even though that's a great miracle of the Moabite uh, soldier coming back to life, and we shout over that, it's wonderful. But there was a sad part of the story is that mantle should have been passed on to the next generation. And But you say, well, when it's buried with one generation, Several generations later, when a hunger and a desire for that same power to be manifested, what do they do? Do they have to go to the boneyard or to the graveyard and dig up uh, this mantle there? No, 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 not at all. But what we can do when that hunger and thirst for God erupts into a generation that several generations have been removed from the power in its act activity, what can happen is we can get down on our knees and we can pray, seek the Lord until He resurrect that power again and place that mantle back on his people one more time. Amen? And then there comes the responsibility that when we end our days that we do not end it and be buried with that mantle so to speak. But it has been passed on to another generation that has been discipled, that's been mentored, that has been taught, that's been instructed and they themselves by the time we pass on they should be mature enough and then do it greater works and go on to do greater works than we are doing right now. Amen? So we want to think now out into the future and into the future generation and we do not want to make the mistake that Isaac made. You see when you talk about the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham was a man of faith and power. Uh, he was God's uh, diamond in the rough, so to speak, in this world and in the culture that was so pagan and absent with God. And so Abraham comes on the scene and he is a man of faith and ultimately he is a man of power with God. The next generation as we have been learning, if we are not careful from one generation to the next, things can become weaker and weaker and weaker instead of getting stronger and stronger. And so when you see movements that begin on fire today are not on fire. When you look at the Methodists, not throwing stones at anybody, everybody is in this boat. When you look at Methodism today is nowhere what it was over a hundred years ago. They 
They are nowhere near what Jonathan Wesley was or Charles Wesley. They do not have, but it's the same way in all denominations. I will tell you, even in the Pentecostal side and Assemblies of God, they are far removed what they were after Azusa Street. <laughs> okay, the church got the same thing. What has happened is simply this. God wants to stop this thing from continually happening, happening from generation to generation. What happens is you get an Isaac after Abraham. Isaac was a good man, but there was a problem with him. He did not have the fire as his father did. He was not the man of faith his daddy was. And he was to be the bridge between Abraham, his father, and Jacob, his son. The problem was the fire of God in his life was now being replaced by memories of yesteryear, and the smoke of self began to erupt. The zeal of God in Isaac's life was being replaced by apathy, lethargy, and a slothfulness, spiritually speaking. A spiritual mind was now being replaced by a carnal mind. The eternal was being replaced by the temporal. <clears throat> Spiritual appetite was being replaced by the physical appetite. Religious talk and routine was being substituted for prayer. Always remember that. It's good to talk religious. It's good to talk spiritual. But ultimately, that's not a substitute for doing the spiritual things. Amen? It's one thing to talk about prayer. It is another thing to set the example in prayer. <laughs> this is what I said this morning. When we're handing off the baton to the next generation, we can talk about the value of prayer all we want. But but if they never see us pray, then it's done nothing but hinder their progress and set a good example. Amen? I believe younger generation needs to see the older on fire for God and not just looking to check out, but they're seeking God even more than they ever have in their life. Amen? I, I mean, I'm not talking. They don't have to be as physically. You know, the older you get, physically we're not as quick as we used to be. Amen? And Brother Matt will shout amen on the ball field towards me this year. But you see, we're not as, we're not as quick. As, well, it doesn't have it. But do you know that your spiritual man, Paul said, even though outwardly I'm dying every day, but he said inwardly I'm being renewed day by day. Amen? Inside the fire doesn't have to be out. Even though I'm not doing this, people should be able to detect there is a fire burning inside of my soul. I ought to be 95 years old and even though I may not be running around like this and at 95 I might be walking like this, but I just want to tell you something. I still, people could be able to see and say, boy that Reuben Eagle, he's not as fast at 95, but inside, boy, you can tell there is a fire burning in his soul. Amen? Well, you see, now, now I want to continue on. Isaac here, you see, he was this was all leading to a disoriented family which was confused and dysfunctional, and by the time Jacob arrived and then his family, honey, you're in ultimate dysfunction and problems. And the reason why was Isaac lost the vision of the generational vision in his life. He, he started living for himself Cell, and he was not paying attention to the next generation. And that's why Jacob was born the way he was, as a thief, a supplanter, a deceiver, and God had to knock him down to side, uh, size at Bethel. And you remember that story? And put a limp in his side, and finally he came to God and then became the firebrand God originally intended him and his father to be. Amen? So we do not want to be an Isaac generation by dropping the baton to the next generation. Now, when you look at this in this morning, I'm going to show you this. <laughs> we was talking about honor and worship. And I, I, I got to show you this. Look at ch uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Are you there? Amen. Amen. Let's read this together. Uh, 1, 2, and 3. I'm sorry. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Mm. Notice something here about honor. Honor is not worship. <laughs> worship is not for any other human being. Now, I want these fellows to come up here now. Uh, just stay where you are, Ryan. Come here, Jordan. I want you, what we did here this morning. Brother Butch, I want you to stand over there as Jesus and face towards us over there. All right? Now, and I said this morning, when we start on this journey, let's say, Mr. Walls. I know it's Walls because it says it right here on his, amen. I know most of you see his head. Just, you know, now, this guy, this guy, he is just, just saved. He's just saved. 
Now, I am a pastor. We're going to finish what we started this morning. I'm a pastor. Here he is, a new convert in Christianity. What is my relationship to him? Right away, I come alongside of him, and as a shepherd, under shepherd, pastor, I have that position, I am to walk with him, not forever, but I'm to walk side by side for a moment and for a while, okay? Now, as we're walking, I'm going to get my Bible here because I'm going to show you some things. As we're walking together, we start to walk. Take one step. As we walk, he runs into a little problem. And the problem is spiritually. Keep this in your spiritual mind. I won't untie. Man, it looks like you spent an hour on doing that. All right. I'll let, he comes and he looks at me spiritually, let's say, and put it the equivalent to this. He looks at me and says, Pastor Reuben, uh, I don't know how to tie my shoes. <laughs> now, a, a babe, a little child... I understand that, and I say, hey, let me help you on that. Let me help you. Now, what I do is I don't get down there and just do it for him, and that's it. I will say, now, you watch me how I do it, and you learn how to do it by the way I'm doing it, okay? When I get down here and I'm tying his shoes up, he's to be paying attention, learning, because I'm not creating dependence in him on me. I'm showing him because the next time he needs to learn how to tie his shoes himself, Come here, Donnie. I wasn't going to use you like this, but let's say Donnie, he's over here, okay? Donnie's over here. Donnie's been saved, uh, let's say, 30 years, all right? I know he don't look it, but here it is. Donnie's been saved for 30 years. Now, <clears throat> this guy's been saved for a week. I need my shoes tied. Can you help me? Yeah, I'll help you. But I'm going to tell you something, Jordan. I I'm not going to just pray for you. I'm going to show you how to do it. 30 years this guy's been saved. He calls me up. <laughs> Pastor Reuben, <laughs> could you tie my shoes? <laughs> what are you going to say, Brother Reuben? Because you're going to be so loving. No. You know what I'm going to say? Tie them yourself. <laughs> Come on, you better shout amen or I'm going <laughs> to. Okay? You, you, know, you know, 30 years, 30 years, if he hasn't learned to tie his shoes, I'd have to ask the question, what's he been doing for 30 years? Because you've got to learn to tie your shoes before you get out there running around. Amen? So what's he been doing for 30 years? What has happened is, too many times, this is how people view a pastor and how pastor even views people. That all it is is a babysitting club. I didn't think there'd be a lot of amens. I'm sorry, I'm preach it anyway. It's not a babysitting club. Shepherding is not a babysitting romper room club. There is a place for the babies. But they don't remain babies. It's expected they get out the door and don't come back to the romper room. See, he's allowed to bawl and squall over the dumbest stuff. I stepped on my foot. Did I step on your foot? I'm sorry. You better get close and be quiet. Anyhow, he, listen, he will, the least little thing, least little thing, he's going to work one morning. I get a call. Pastor Ruben, my day's falling apart. I don't know. I tell you, I thought serving God was better than this. I, I, oh, I, I can't hardly tell you. What happened, Jordan? What happened? Well, I had a flat tire on the way to work. And I roll my eyes think, oh, my goodness. But I understand he's a babe in Christ. What do I do at that time? I don't just say, sorry, Jordan, I'll pray for you. No, no, no. I will teach him principles out of the Word and show him that he has to grow, that that's not the end of the world. Don't let your circumstances cloud your relationship with Christ. Are you hearing me? Now it's up to him to put that into practice. What's really bad is 30 years into Christianity, this is Jordan again 30 years later. No, I just 30 years later, he calls me up and says the same thing. Pastor Ruben, you got to pray. I'm telling you, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and oh, I'm, I mean, the world's just crashing in. The day's terrible. I don't know what to do. What's wrong, Brother Donnie? And he says, Well, I, I had a flat tire on the way to work. Do you know what he views me as? All I am, all I am to him is somebody that he just wants to stick a binky, oh my goodness, stick a binky in his mouth. All he wants me as a pastor to be is, is when any little thing happens, now burp, honey, now burp. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is why the church in America is so stunted. They've got the wrong views of what the pastor is, and many of the pastors have the wrong views of what the people are. 
There's to be a healthy relationship, but we've got to perverted things a little bit. Amen? All right, now, you can, you can be seated. I've done tortured you enough, but we're coming back to you. Now, stay there, Jordan. I'm coming back to you, and he's old me and an old mind. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to bring this down to you. Now, he is not to worship me, but he is to honor me. Okay? There's a difference there. I don't, see, worship is only exclusively for God. Nobody else. You don't worship another man laterally, nowhere. It's always vertically to God. Amen? Always. But honor is reserved for positional people in, whether it's government, in the civil authorities and so forth as well, and also in spiritual authority. God requires there's an honor system. He didn't say worship but he says, honor them. Now, let me just break that down. When you honor a parent, we are never commanded to worship our mother and father, but we are commanded to honor them. What is the difference? Well, there is a difference. I don't want to get into all of this, but when you're dealing with honor and worship, worship is a compound word. It's all, it comes out of the old English all the way up from the Latin. It's worth ship. It's even spelled differently in its original S-C-I-P-E was the actual ship before. But worth ships mean that you give value uh, ship actually means quality. And so when that's tagged on to something, well, you use words now, friendship, uh, sportsmanship, all of that. What does that mean? It means that if you have a good friendship, friendship means it's a quality friend relationship. Okay? So we understand the difference there. When you do it, worth, is giving worth to God, and it's a quality worth, esteeming Him greater than everything else. Even in the Greek and the Hebrew, there is two words for uh, giving that kind of worship. And one is, one is physical, one is voice. One is, is the physical prostration or kneeling before God like this. What that is, is that my, my, my body, body language is speaking spiritually for me that when I kneel, I'm praying or whatever, or giving him worship. When I kneel, what am I doing? I'm saying to God, I am ready and willing to surrender and do anything you tell me to do. Amen. Okay? That is what it is. Then it deals with voice. So we, are, we can worship God with what we say, but that's only one third of it. We are to worship God with our hearing, and we are to worship God with our doing. So we have an opportunity to worship God actually every day that we live. And it's not just necessarily singing Amazing Grace, which is worship, but it's also when we're out there on the job, when we do a good job by our doing, we are worshiping God. What are we doing? Testifying of His greatness. Honor is simply esteeming and valuing what God has given to somebody or what have you. And so when we're in this, one of the prerequisites is if he's going to grow in God, he has to honor the pastor. <laughs> if he doesn't, then what he does is he, cut, he closes the door of access to his heart for me to influence him, and now pride sets in, and he's going to do it his way, and he does not ascribe to any spiritual authority. Ultimately, he does not even ascribe to God's authority. See, even in the home, children are commanded to honor their parents. Why? Because the parents was the representatives of God's authority in the home. If a child can't obey their parents, they will not obey God. Okay? It, not, this is a fact. This is, parent, they just, it is the, if I can't listen, this is why we are to obey civil authorities and government and so forth, because they are God's representation of authority. It, it, you know, we had this move some years back, for no reason, the drug culture and all of that. They was running around, and they called the police pigs. You remember that? They called them the pigs, 60s, 70s. Oh, they're nothing but pigs. And I'll tell you what, that generation was godless too. They didn't respect authority there. They didn't respect God's authority either. That's why they lived the way they did, and the culture ran them up. So now he has to honor me as his pastor, esteem me, and honor me. Now, we walk together through this life. Now, when, as we start, let's walk again, and now I've got to get into a little more. As we're walking, he comes to another problem, and like I said this morning, he says to me, Pastor, I've got a little problem here, and I give him the word. I give him some more, and I show him here. I said, this is what needs to be done in your life, Jordan. You need to obey this, and this is what's lacking. All right, Pastor, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to carry on. We continue walking on. Now, just walk about uh, two-thirds of the way towards Brother Butch there in symbolic Jesus. After a while, 
He gets more mature. He keeps growing, and he keeps going. Now, our relationship now changes. I didn't say we don't have a relationship. It's simply the dynamics change, okay? Now, what is now, what is his relationship to me, and what is mine to him? What has changed? Let me explain it. It's like this. Number one, <clears throat> His relationship to me now is when he comes to the house of God, all week he has been worshiping God, living for God, praying. He's been spiritually maintaining himself. He's done everything he's known, and continued revelation is coming. Now he comes to church, okay? Now, you just sit here, Jordan. Just sit down there. Now when he comes to church, one of the main dynamics of our relationship is he's been asking God and praying for his pastor. He wants to know new revelation that he needs to know so he can grow. So when he comes to church, he does his worship. He worships God. He praises God. He, he magnifies the Lord. And, and now <laughs> he comes to church to exercise his worship and now to hear what the Word of God is going to say to him. He doesn't look at me simply as a man, just me. He hears the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through me. He sees me as a channel. He doesn't worship me. He doesn't put Reuben on, a, on this pedestal of godness, no. But he realized that I have a position and it's influential in his life. And so now when he comes, we have a trusting relationship and I'm up here and I'm preaching away. He's receiving that word. Then what does he do? He realizes that every message is meant for him personally as well. Okay? And then when he gets up and leaves the church, he carries it not out anywhere. He carries it in his heart. He meditates on what was preached. He doesn't just leave and say, oh, bravo, good message, and leave the church, and that's the end of it. He takes his notes with him. He takes the scriptures with him. He keeps meditating on the message, and for the next several days, he prays about it and says, God, I need that revelation that you gave through my pastor, and I'm going to apply it to my own life. And he puts it into exercise throughout that week. Can somebody say amen? amen? Now, as he's doing that, now come back up here and stand over here. Now, as through the week, now what else is he doing? And I'm going to come to my relationship responsibility to him in just a moment. Now, look over at Donnie. Now, Donnie is unsaved. Come here, Ryan. And, and let's make Daniel, he's unsaved, okay? Now, Let's say, Ryan, now you can face Daniel there. And both of these boys, next generation young folks, and they've been mentored. Now they're growing. Now they've grown. Now, throughout the week, now what are they doing? They've been discipled. They've been mentored. They've been structured. Now what is their responsibility? They are to go and give, excuse me, give birth to more lambs. Am I right, brother? <laughs> now they are to go and do the work. Now what are they doing? They got old Donnie down here. Boy, the old drunk, he needs saved. All right, now, now I'm just picking on you, Donnie. And so he, he, he comes and he's working there, all right? He's working with Daniel. And Daniel's got all kinds of problems, all right? He's in sin. And so Ryan is dealing with him. Now, they're busy doing the work, okay? Now, <laughs> they are to keep praying for their pastor, right? As they are doing the work also. Now, my relationship back to them, look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. I'm going to come back to some more here. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 17 quickly. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. What is my relationship now back to these young men and ladies and whomever else? What is my relationship now? Because I have a lot of responsibility as well. Are you there at verse 17? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Obey them. Let's all read together. Now, it's King James here, okay? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, as these guys are working with these unsaved, and they're, just, they're getting them in and getting them saved, and they're doing some discipling of their own. Now, what is my responsibility? My responsibility is, and I'm putting myself up here, I as a pastor am to be a watchman. You read it in the Old Testament, Ezekiel really talks about it, as a watchman. And in the New Testament, I'm also known as a pastor to be a watchman. As these men are working in the field, 
I go to an elevation here and this is what they would do. What were they watching for? They were watching for danger and when danger would come, they would have to go take care of it. Okay? Let me just, let me just show you some of this. As they're winning others in their activity. I pray for him and I pray for Ryan as a watchman. I pray for their lives and pray for their success. Also, when I'm praying, guess what else I'm doing? Spiritual authority, something the American church doesn't know much about. But spiritual authority is as they continue to submit to God and do his work, when I'm praying for them, I'm putting a spiritual authority and covering out over their lives. As I'm praying for them, they are under scriptural authority and protection. They are not rogue vagabonds spiritually just running amok and running here and there. They are under, God placed them here, and now God has entrusted them into my responsibility. I do become responsible for their protection and well-being to a certain extent. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so as I'm praying for them, I'm placing a covering over their lives. And at the same time, I'm continually staying sensitive in the spirit and watching out, is there any danger that's creeping up on their lives? Now, when this happens, I got these things written down so I don't uh, miss anything. You see, as I'm watching, if, say, say Jordan here, all of a sudden as he's working in the vineyard, he, he starts to fall under a wrong influence. And he's, I see he's getting in danger. Now, I'm watching this, and all of a sudden I detect something, and it's, it's wrong. It's bad. Something's wrong in this situation. Immediately, I am to come down and come right to him. Now, remember our relationship? He was here, and I was back there. Immediately, I'm to come in and get in beside of him, and I'm to say, Jordan, there's a problem in here, and we need to not only pray about it, I'm going to show you what the problem is, and it has to be corrected for your spiritual well-being. He has a responsibility now to submit to the scriptural authority and say, I'm not going to fight this. I know that he's right. I'm now going to pray through. God help me to mold uh, to your image in a greater capacity. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or he can look at me and say, who do you think you are? (laughs) If that happens, he just shut her down right there. Okay? We're not talking dictatorship. I'm talking about scriptural authority. If that is the truth and that is right, then he submits to that, then he's better for it. Now he's protected. If he doesn't, he now leaves the covering and something bad will happen. Okay? You follow what I'm saying here? And so, so follow this very clear. Now, <clears throat> he honors, listen to this. I got this wrote down. The Lord was bringing things to me. He honors Ryan... Ryan and Jordan both, they honor me by what? As they're out here working, they protect my reputation. What do you do? As a pastor, I have their back when they get in trouble. It is a family relationship over and over. As they protect that reputation out there, as they get in trouble and he gets in trouble, I'm there right away, put my arm around him. I'm there to help protect him. We're never to be alone. (laughs) This is why we need family, the church family. See, when people branch out and run off in rebellion, they've lost scriptural authority and they become spiritual rogues and vagabonds. That is not how God envisioned it. We are to be plugged in to a local church family. Amen? Amen? And that's what it's all about. Amen? So these guys, as they're working with them, they're not alone. Holy Spirit is with us, directing their pathway. At the same time, I am to be watching out for them. And if there's any trouble, I get there with them and help protect them and bring a correction or whatever the case, and so that they can bring these guys in as well. Now, stand up. You two fellas stand up. And here these are, these old sinners. And now they got saved, and they're working with them, living examples. Now, what do they do? They can't wait. Where are they bringing them to? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, where is Jesus? They're in the midst of them. So God is here with us, right? Now, they bring them in. Now, you two fellows go over there now. Now, you two. Now, they're going to continue on the vineyard. Now, they bring them into the house. Come on down here, fellows. And they bring them in. And here, now, look what happens. We start it all over again. (laughs) Huh? And so now we start walking together. 
Donnie, would you grow up? No, I'm just, okay. And here, I, now we, now you two fellows just act like you're over here. Now you're over there. You're, you're working in the vineyard. Now they're back with other people now. Here I come now. Now it's my responsibility. I'm still watching over them, still watching. But now they're entrusted into this care now. And I walk with them and I say, well, we got a problem. We got a problem. All right. And the next thing you know, we're walking together. And after a while, those two fellows, and they just can, now they walk on. Our relationship dynamic changes. And now they go on. Guess what they do? They'll do what those two fellows did. Now they're out discipling. Now they're out winning souls. And now they're bringing others into the fold. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If everybody does their part, you would be a... You, I want to tell you something. If the church in America would do what their part is, you couldn't keep enough space in the building for everybody that would come. You know, I, saw, I actually saw a statistic and heard a guy talking about it. He said, you would be amazed how many people would come to church if they were simply asked. Amen. What did we say this morning, Ryan? Was it 3%? 3% of American Christians only win a soul in their, don't even win a soul in their entire lifetime. Now that's bad news. Something wrong in the church, but we're going to fix it. Amen? Amen. This church is going further and deeper. Amen? All right. I pray that that was a blessing to you. And now, <laughs> here another part two to part two today. <laughs> but I'm getting ready here to introduce the last part of this program. Uh, is a very, very dear ministerial friend of mine, uh, Messianic Evangelist Fred Schmidt. And he's going to finish out the program. I will talk to you at the very end, but he's going to finish out the program in a segment here of about 25 minutes of teaching. And this was his kickoff to the parables. And he did the eight parables. I kept saying seven, but it was eight parables of, of Matthew chapter 13. He did a dynamic job as he always does. And, and really just, I sat up here on the front row and just took it in was doing notes and so forth, and it was just a blessing. I can't say enough about this dear brother, and I said to our people, he's really getting fatherly to us, and we appreciate him to no end. So I pray this is a blessing, but he's going to be teaching on and introducing understanding the Word of God and the parables. Enjoy. Anyone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ will automatically love the Bible yes. Amen. because it is God's Word. Two scriptures stand out to me. One is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That word God is Elohim. The word Elohim means gods, more than one person. It's giving you recognition of the three persons in the Godhead. Then in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's my Jesus. Yes. He was there in the creation process. It was He who did the work. He was authorized by the Heavenly Father to head up the entire redemptive program. Now remember, uh, at the time the Lord laid the foundations of the earth, he assigned Lucifer to oversee this planet. Somewhere in that range after that promotion, Lucifer fell, rebelled against God, enticed one third of the angelic populace to follow him, made war with God, lost that war. That's good news. And was given the left foot of fellowship. That means he was drop kicked out of heaven and was limited. He can no longer go back to the planet heaven, God's universal headquarters. Now he is limited to the environs of this planet, planet Earth. That's why he is called the prince of the powers of the air and the God or the prince of this world. So he's currently still in charge of this planet. But we're inch by inch taking it away from him. That's why God created Adam and Eve. Uh, for the purpose of creating righteous seed that would overrule the wicked seed and bring about redemption to mankind. Well, we've come a long way. Here we are in the last of the last days on the verge of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to take us home to glory 
And this is an exciting time to be living. I can't think of a more blessed time unless you wanted to be there at the time of his virgin birth. But to be in these last days on the brink of Christ coming for us, brother, that's enough to make a deacon shout. And I've been in some churches where that would take a miracle. <laughs> One thing is paramount. And that is an understanding of the past if you want to get an understanding of the future. Because the past will link you to the future. The Bible is more than a history book, but part of it is history. Along with that history are truths, dispensational truths, that link you from one era to another era on to this present time. We currently live in a time called the dispensation of the grace of God. Within the grace of God dispensation, there is an age attached and embedded in it called the church age. You and I as born again believers are part of that. We're at the final days of the church age. And Jesus is about to rapture, catch up, take away from planet earth those who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and is going to take us home to heaven. Good news. Yes. We're getting out of here. Yes. I'm so happy and thrilled and thankful God has provided an exit plan for his children. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we know we're getting out of here before the bad stuff hits. Oh, it could get rough before that, but it's minor compared to what is going to happen after Jesus has come and taken us home. What are the purposes of Christ coming for the blood bought before the tribulation begins is to take us out of harm's way. Since we are children of the light and Jesus is that light, then of course we are not the children of the night. It is the children of the night who must go through the night of the tribulation judgments. I hope that makes it overall clear to us. One thing that is important in any study of the Word of God, whether you're dealing with doctrine, whether you're dealing with just historic truth, uh, or whether you're dealing with the prophetic Word of God, is to learn how to rightly divide the truth. Now, to rightly divide the truth of, and the Word of God is that truth, ladies and gentlemen. We must, we must first of all lay aside preconceived ideas. Remember this, the word of God is the word from God to mankind. And that word is eternal. I have been in islands preaching the gospel. I was the first one there. No one had ever, ever been there before to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. No one knew about salvation. It was pioneer work. And just preaching the word of God that they have never heard before in their life, in all of their generations from the beginning. Just the purity and the power and the authenticity of the word of God made them drop their idols and come to Christ by the thousands. Praise God. In five nights time, we can almost guarantee we would have 1,000 souls come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's beautiful. And we've done this time after time after time. It's been awesome. And it shows you the power of the name of Jesus. Yes. And how the truth of God's doctrines in the Word of God register and resonate and witness to the heart of the wicked person. And he realizes he needs to be saved. And there's only one way to get that salvation. And that is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, when you're doing investigative work, remember, God is the boss. Everything he has said, he's written in proper chronological order. Oh, now and then, he will bear witness to something that happened in yesterday's generation. Or he will prophesy ahead to what is coming in the final days of mankind on the earth. But basically he will stay in that particular experience for those particular people and for that time. And if you can get the proper time frame of the event, 
then you can put it in proper perspective when studying other doctrinal things in the Word of God and uh, everything will come out right. You won't have to realign yourself and your belief system later on down the line. That's important. Yes. So the basic rules are, of study are accept the Word of God as from God. Not just something man wrote. Sure, God used male secretaries. Do you hear that, ladies? He used male secretaries to write down what he told them to write down. Put every comma where it belongs, every jot, every tittle, every period, every ex exclamation point, every word as he gave it. One thing about the Bible you'll find that is so interesting, especially to a sinner, it exposes the sin in people as well as the righteousness of God. And it'll tell a person when he's right with God, and he'll tell, it'll tell the person when he's not right with God. And he will show you in the Word of God what he does in retributive judgment, chastisement upon those who sin because you never get away with it. It's never a secret. It may be your secret, but uh, how many here believe you have a guardian angel? Yes. Yeah. Just to remind you, he takes notes. <laughs> So the Bible is not like any other book in the world. It is the infallible Word of God. I can speak something from the Word of God when I'm in the presence of demoniac people and suddenly there is a respect and it has saved my life actually at times. The Word of God is pure because it's from God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Hallelujah. The same was in the beginning with God. So it shows you the triunity of the, of the Godhead, but it also shows you the power of that Word, the Word that comes from Jesus Christ and from God the Father. So the Bible is not a mystical book so much that it would drive you away. Anything that is called a mystery is a mystery because you don't know what it means. That's a mystery. And oft times when the Lord has introduced a new thing in the printed Word of God, He has called it a mystery. He's done that in the eight parables found in Matthew chapter 13. They're, they are mysteries. But once He explains them, they cease to be a mystery. The mystery is gone. It's ended. Now you have basic knowledge. Now you have clarity and you have understanding. Uh, man was created a living soul. He will worship God if he knows about God. I've been to pagan lands, many of them all around the world, and I have found that people will exercise the worship of a God if he does not have the, the knowledge of the God. And I've found that in the Philippine Islands, for instance. Uh, the Filipinos on one island we went to that had never heard the gospel before were worshiping a stone. It was an unusual kind of stone, not like you usually find because everything is volcanic uh, in the Philippines. But this was a different kind of stone and it was along the seashore. So the natives propped it up and anointed it as a god and began to pray to it, thought it was a living thing. Of course, that's dumb as a red brick. But then when we came along and we gave them the true Word of God, they dumped the stone and they came to the, the real rock of salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that happens all over the world. Never has there been found an atheist pagan tribe. Did you know that? Never has there been found a pagan uh, uh, atheist tribe. Never. There was one time when uh, one of the liberal news medias said that they found a tribe in South America who were atheists. Uh, but then when the truth came out, they were a tribe who had a previous knowledge about God, rebelled against it, and chose to be atheistic. Amen. And so their story wasn't accurate at all. They didn't tell the whole, all of the facts. But man has created a living soul in the image of God. You're going to live forever. Amen. I don't know if that's a shock to some or not, but you're going to live forever. Amen. 
Now the big question is, where? Yes. There are only two places to go when you kick the bucket. Amen. Number one, heaven. I hope you all go there. You'll have to meet the conditions to get there. Yes. Number two, hell. You don't have to do a thing. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Keep the Lord out of your life. Live your life and you will go to hell just fine. Amen. And that's the way it is. Plain and simple. Uh, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 1 verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, once you see that we're in the last days, and even sinners are realizing this now and admitting uh, it's never been like this. We've never seen the weather like this. We've never seen government in this sad uh, condition. We've never seen uh, attention and stress uh, like it is today. They realize something big is about to happen. And many of them who've heard something about the gospel are realizing God's behind all of this. Even though Satan is doing a lot of the evil work on planet earth, God is allowing certain things to happen on the earth to turn the hearts of men to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they'll be saved. I'm uh, looking at a scripture here, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made by hand, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all to, uh, life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed. Now remember what I just showed you there hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. Everything has a boundary. Now, whether it's birds or whether it's beasts or whether it's vegetation or whether it's fish in the sea, everything has bounds or boundaries for its habitation. And they live within those boundaries and they have to admit those boundaries. In the last days, God is telling us that there are, there is a rebellion against the boundaries. Everyone is created for a purpose. Everyone has a, a purpose that God is going to fulfill in his life. Only rebellion against that and a determination to go some other way will bring confusion, destroy that purpose, and take you on a different route. And that can be very sad. They that, should, uh, they that should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And that is a fact. He is here. He's here this morning. And he's going to see uh, to your safety spiritually. He will open the word of God to you. And you'll see things you never saw before. And I trust in this series we're about to embark on, you're going to see that as fact. You're going to see things. As good a student as you are in the word of the Lord, uh, God is going to show you fresh material, greater insight. Yes. But the Bible tells us in verse 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. There was a time when God let it pass, let it slide. Maybe another time there will be a visitation from heaven and they will open up their hearts and their minds to me. Uh, there was a time when God winked at it. But the closer we get to the critical hour that is in the end time, now we can't afford to be slack. And so he's, he tells us, th this is interesting, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Uh, you're running out of time. When you're running out of time, you can't afford to play church and you can't afford, afford a, a lot of patience like you've had in the past. Now it's time to tighten the rope and get ready for whatever is coming. And in this case, it's judgment. And for the saints of God, it's the rapture, the catching away of the born again, blood bought ones to heaven. And that's beautiful. Because he hath appointed a day. Do you realize what he just said? He has appointed a day, a specific day, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen. So all things point to Christ. All truth points to him. 
By the way, that's in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 31. So all studies made in the Word of the Lord have to take into recognition that God is boss and He is not to be questioned. Uh, if you rebel against what He says, you do pay the price. The, it isn't a freebie. You're not just let go and I can go my way and nobody's going to be the wiser and nobody's going to be harmed. I'll just do what I want to do and let the other guys do what they want to do. That doesn't cut it with God at all. All of us are totally, absolutely responsible to God. One of the basic things <clears throat> about the creation of man is the same thing he did in the creation of angels installed in them the right and the privilege to make personal choices. That is called free moral agency. Amen. Not only the ability of, but the responsibility of making right choices. And you're faced with decisions, moral decisions, every day of your life. Because the same devil you can't see is working in your mind Amen. and is attacking your thought processes. Amen. And we'll do that in every person. Why? Because he wants you on his side because he knoweth, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And everybody knows misery loves company. <laughs> You remember when you were a kid and you got chastised and you tried to put blame on the other kid too so that he could get a spanking along with you? Yeah, misery loves company. But now we're going to be getting into this series on the parables of Matthew chapter 13. The use of parables was and is a unique way to reveal biblical truth to an audience. It's really quite amazing. It's an illustrative comparison. Uh, it's a way of enhancing our understanding of the value of what God is trying to convey to us. And as you know, the greatest example of this is Yeshua himself. That's the Jewish way of saying Jesus. The Greek word used in the Bible for, par uh, for parable is paraboli. Uh, sounds almost Italian. Makes you wish, where's the spaghetti? Uh, it, it means an illustration, an illustration. It is used in several scriptures. I'm going to give them to you now. If you're jotting down notes, do so fast. Matthew chapter 13, verses 3, 10, 13, 18, 24, 31 through 36, and verse 53. Matthew 15, verse 15. Matthew 21, verse 33 and verse 45, and chapter 22, verse 1, and chapter 24, verse 32. This isn't all of the scriptures uh, that uh, use parabolic speaking as a means of conveying truth, uh, but it's enough to get your, what your appetite. Uh, paraboli also has other meanings. Uh, one thing that is beautiful about the Hebrew language as well as the Greek, the Hebrew even more than the Greek, one word can be used a half a dozen ways and all of them truth. For instance, paraboli al also means a comparison and that is found in Mark chapter 4 verse 30. It also means a proverb. And that is found in Luke chapter 4 and uh, verse 23 in the first half of the verse. And it also means a figure. In Hebrews chapter 9 it speaks of this verse 9 and also chapter 11 verse 19. So they can be called extended similes, if you will. Uh, they often illustrate a truth making it clear by using comparison to make the picture more vivid or to make you see a picture in the first place. Uh, it, it's, and what it's, com it's compared with is something that's familiar with the hearer. For instance, you would use a farmer's illustration if you're around the farmer uh, community. You'd use a fishing or uh, water illustration when you're around fishermen and so on. And, and you can see more about this in the writings of 2 Samuel chapter 12. It, it uses parabolic illustrations uh, way back then. So parables uh, stimulate interest in the subject. 
uh, once you get something that clicks in your mind, oh, I know about that. All of a sudden, what is being said that compares to it or uh, is illustratively pointing to it, you're getting new truth. It's reaching cells of the mind that weren't reached before. And that is a good thing. Matthew chapter 13 uh, in verses 10 through 17 and 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, show parables in a unique fashion there. There's a feeling of trust that is conveyed and confidence uh, generated with their usage because the stories used are always true. Never do you use a, a phony or lie uh, 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 illustration. It is, all of that is totally absent. So truth is always used to illustrate truth. And that's important. The illustrations offered uh, fit not only the historical, but also fit the cultural, the present, and the future. So it is absolute truth that hits you, stays with you, and uh, makes the audience more knowledgeable. Another thing notable about the usage of uh, parables is the description of the details in an illustration uh, are not s literal, but are spiritual. You're getting a spiritual lesson out of, a, uh, out of a literal experience. And you can see, oh, I see the comparison here. And you're getting the impact of a parable. And so it will hit the listener's mind. And the point that is illustrated with the parable is emphasized and is seen clearly. Now it was Messiah Yeshua himself who revealed the basic principles of the interpretation of Scripture. We've gotten fancy with the wording uh, in Greek terminology and in Bible college classes. We call it hermeneutics. It's a big, big word makes us look like we're smart. Well, I pray that that whetted your whistle, so to speak, and uh, he was a blessing. And in five services, we really, really enjoyed. The presence of God was here immensely, and we thank God for Brother Schmidt, and I pray it was a blessing to you as well. Also here to end the program, let me bring you up to speed on uh, checking out the articles. I'm writing at least two articles a week. They're short, up to about 800 words a piece on the blog. And you can go to the website, explife.org, and go right right to the blog or over to Mount Calvary as well uh, and navigate all around. There's a lot of resources and things on there for you. You go to the church website, directions, everything, product pages. EXP Life has all of those things as well and taking you over to the YouTube. But do check out the blog spot and Ruben e. Goff at blogspot.com. Just check that out. See what you think of all of the articles I'm writing every week and you can submit yourself on there with email. We'll keep you updated. All right. God bless. See you next time. Experience life today.